Welcome to CXQA Live, the show where we have the opportunity to speak with talented thought leaders and discuss the importance of the most valuable asset in your contact center, the agent. For those of you listening to this discussion via our Recorded for Quality Assurance podcast, we'd like to remind you that we host these sessions live every Tuesday at noon Eastern time. So if you've got a burning question about CX that you need answered, make sure to register and add your voice to the conversation. Here on CXQA Live, we believe that agents with the right tools, training, and connection with your company will be a revenue growth and protection center for your brand. They'll be the best diagnostic tool you have for your business. They will ensure that your customers are satisfied and connected. They will produce more and better work, and they'll actually want to stay and contribute to the well-being of your company. Well, ladies and gentlemen, today I am joined by a great friend of mine. He is a top 25 ICMI thought leader, and he has overseen CX operations for CCI for almost 20 years. Please welcome the one, the only, Jacob Shields. Thanks for being here today, Jacob, with a C. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my fellow Jacob with a K. Yes, sir. I <laughs> no, appreciate you having me, and I, I look forward to uh, a great discussion today on on CX and and all yeah. around our topic. Yeah, so I mean, man, let's go ahead, let's rip this band-aid right off. So sure. today's episode, we are focused on why working as a contact center rep is not the most attractive job in the world. So yeah, it's it's an entry level job that almost anybody can work, right? But typically within a few years, months, even weeks or days, most of your reps are already back on the market begging for a new opportunity and they want nothing to do with customer anything. So Absolutely. let's let's unpack that a little bit, right? Uh, so I guess one of the main reasons that people are avoiding that uh, situation in the first place is because call centers themselves have such a bad reputation. So why do you why do you think that is? Why do you think that call centers have such a bad rep to begin with? So I think let's break it down and begin with one of the first things that people get. They get calls, right? As a consumer, you get a call at 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock at night, and it's somebody calling you to talk about, hey, can you take the survey? Let's talk about the next presidential election that's upcoming or the next you know, Senate race or House person that's going to get elected, right? You get those yeah. calls. Those are annoying, for one. Nobody wants to get those types of calls. The next one is scammers. You get somebody who calls and says, hey, we saw your, your social security number has been breached. Let's go ahead and you know pay this $125 and you can go ahead and get it removed. And there's no more federal charge. It's going to, you know, somebody's going to come knock on your door. Um, or, you know, the, the alternative is really stuff breaks at your house. You have to contact customer support. You're frustrated as a consumer because things aren't working how it should. Really good example, internet. In today's age, internet is like the fourth utility. You know, you've got your water, electric, um, plumbing, and then you've got internet. Your internet breaks. You're not happy. You are disconnected from the internet. You're disconnected from the world. So you're contacting somebody and saying, hey, I've got this issue. I need to get this resolved. And you're you're probably frustrated. Nine times out of 10, most people are yelling at the agents that are that they're talking to. But the reality of it is, is an agent is somebody there who's trying to help you resolve your issue and take and solve that problem and also look into the future, how they can try to help you further. So you don't have to contact us again, hopefully not for another year or more. We know there's call centers out there that get bombarded with calls. Cable companies are a great example of it where, you know, issues happen in the plant, they're uncontrolled and they get called tons and tons of calls. So I think that's really one of the big reasons why call centers really get such a bad rap and being a frontline agent is just because you're always getting screamed at in, in a lot of ways, right? But when you spin it the alternative way and you start to look at it with a different perspective and understand that, yes, I may get yelled at. Yes, there are downsides to you know the day where it's going to be busy. I'm going to be on back-to-back -back calls. It's going to be stressful. But when you look at it as I'm helping make a difference in what somebody is experiencing, at the end of the day, no matter what, I'm still going to be able to go home and sleep just fine. Whether or not you yelled at me, it doesn't have an impact on my ability to continue my life. 
all you're doing is you're venting your frustration and adding some, and you really need to take and, and provide empathy to that customer. And that's really why I think most people look at call centers as like, oh, it's this terrible job. But no, you're actually a helper and a real key to a brand that can make a huge difference. Yeah, and, and that's very true. And with the experience that I've had personally, uh, anytime I've had to interact with a customer, nine times out of 10, it was a situation where the customer either wasn't communicating something properly or they felt like something wasn't being properly communicated to them. So it was always damage control. There was always this role of kind of like, as you touched on, being a human punching bag. And it takes, yeah, it takes it's a, a great way to reference it, right? That's, yeah, it's, it's it takes a specific type of person with that metal, with that desire to help, to look past this. This person is just angry and they are caring loudly at me and they're not really mad at me. They're mad at the situation. So you have to hire somebody who's who is able to separate work from their personal life. Like one of, one of the biggest problems I have is I get emotionally invested in almost everything I do. And that includes my work. So I, I'm a terrible call center agent. <laughs> as much as though, I that, love. Let me, let me take that though. Sometimes that makes the very best agent. So really, because they will go above and beyond. They will make sure that everything that you you're reaching out about is resolved. And then some. So at the same time, that's not actually a negative. That's actually a really good positive. Um, one of the things that when I first started like attending ICMI and going out to ICMI events, one of the first things that I had ever done was I toured Zappos. And Zappos is notorious for like the industry leader in customer, customer service, customer experience, right? Like they just have that experience about them. They had two of the record holders for the longest calls in the industry over 10 and a half hours on the phone talking with somebody. And so when you talk about, you know, you're very passionate, you get, you know, invested in that. That was something that, you know, there is an example at Zuper that shows that they were invested and that they really care about their customer. And that at the same time is also a good thing. Yeah. And, and thank you for spinning that in that direction. Um, you know, th there is something there's something that I've noticed too, that when you have these people that are so passionate about work, they expect yeah. their companies to be just as passionate as they are when it comes to handling company matters. So one of the most important things that a company can work on to help um, embrace this, this emotional investment that their agents have is to create a space for that to be accepted, not only accepted, but embraced. Yeah. And you really create this amazing company culture out of this. So you have these agents that are so emotionally invested that you need to have a culture that reflects that. So I guess my next question would be, how can a company culture be a differentiator? for people looking to get into the call center game? So I think a lot of that starts with what are the type of customers that you're supporting and what what is the buy-in also from leadership in making sure that you're going to run a successful customer support organization and focus on making sure that agents have the tools that they need and that they're also given the training and the focus and embracement in, in that job. Um, when you look at culture, a lot of companies say that they're family, you know, it's like a family, you know, we're, we're best friends working here. We go out and we hang out after work. Those are things that, that do help. And sure. I mean, we can all call our, our family, you know, our work buddies, family at work. Right. I mean, it, you do eventually spend most of your day with that person at work. But really taking it a step further, it's about showing compassion to the employees and embracing the fact that, yes, days are going to be challenging and you need an outlet to go ahead and actually resolve those challenges that you've just encountered on a call. 
you may have just spent the last hour getting yelled at consistently by the last 10 callers or the last two callers, right? Because it was the worst thing ever. But if you have the mentality that, okay, you need to take a five minute break, go walk it off, go grab something to drink, jump on a call with me. Let's talk through it. And let's talk through the challenges that you just encountered. You start to spin things differently for them. And it makes it more of an accepting environment that yes, we're going to deal with challenges, but we're also here to support one another. So that, that I think is a big piece as well. Um, and just keeping things fun, light and enjoyable. One of the best things I used to love is just being able to, to crack jokes and, and say, yeah, that call sucked, but let's find a way to, to find a joke and get a little laughter instead. And now all of a sudden your, your negative energy that you maybe had starts to wash away because you just forget about it and you're, you're too busy laughing and enjoying everything else. And, and those around you are, you know, jumping in and also cracking jokes. And next thing you know, laughter becomes really a thing around the entire team and everybody's laughing. So yeah. Yeah. And, and to go off of that sense, you know, we've all heard and Rob talks about this all the time on the show. And I, I just <laughs> eventually we're just going to have some California cheese wheels here and <laughs> give them out to anybody who's listening. Perfect. But happy cows make happy milk. Right. Yeah. Whatever culture is reflected in your contact center, that is just going to emanate through all of your agents. Right. Correct. I think what I love about what you just said is you take a, a sucky call, right? Let, let's let's call a spade a spade. A call that did not go well, had a negative outcome. It would be so easy for that emotion to just permeate throughout the contact center. And it will distract your agents and they won't be performing as well because now they're getting that same mentality. Oh, here I am again, this human punching bag, right? Just trying yep. to roll with the punches, grin and bear it, make it through. But yep. when you actually take the time to engage with your agents, and you try to maybe not necessarily fix the problem, but create a space where you turn this negative experience into a positive experience by making them laugh, joke about yeah. it, have a good time. I think that's something that's very undervalued. You know, yeah. ways back when we were starting the show, uh, we had the privilege of talking to Jeremy Hyde and we talked about agent trauma. And I feel like that is a very... I don't want to say neglected, but it's something that people tend to not talk about because it's it's the not so shiny side of the contact center. It is yep. the reason, it, it's the real reason nobody wants to be a contact center rep is because they're right. going through verbal abuse day after day after day. Nobody's calling the contact center to say, hey, I just wanted to call in and say that <laughs> this company has been doing a great job. Thanks a lot. No, that's not how exactly. it works. Exactly. So, when you create that that culture, right? You stop your reps from feeling isolated, like they're being targeted yeah. by customers. And that's just, that's such a beautiful thing. Family has become, a, I don't wanna say a sketchy, but it is a little bit of a controversial term right now, especially with a lot of layoffs going on. Um, right. And when it comes to call center reps, you know, there's that churn and burn mentality um, yeah. and, it's it's been difficult for brands to see the value in their agents to be willing to retain them. You know, the, you hear it all the time. The, the call center is always seen as a cost center. It's a necessary wow. evil. And 100%. that's it's irritating. We're experienced it all the time. You know, it was always, what can we do to cut costs? How can we, you know, how can we make the team even more efficient? How can they take their call times from ten minutes and make it eight minutes? And now, next thing you know, you're adding more you know, more to the person's plate. And it's like, well, you know, how do we instead, let's not look at it that way. Instead, how do we look at it as how do we eliminate the calls? Right. How do we stop the bleeding that's occurring instead? What's actually driving these calls? Why are our agents spending so long on the calls? Let's start to look at the root cause of things instead of trying to build it as a, it's a cost center. It's unnecessary evil that we have to have. No, that is what is unlocking a company's potential that is the piece where you can either make or break a business. And, and, you know, going back to even, you know, the, the piece where we were kind of talking about the, the punching bag, right. There was a time where in my call center, at one point we had that negativity that was permeating throughout the call center. We didn't necessarily have the best Avenue, 
But the one thing is, is it, it allowed us the opportunity to really learn from that and say, what's going on? Why do we have all this negativity here? And when we started peeling it back, we were able to better understand, okay, the agents really don't have a good avenue to be able to vent. They don't have the best way to step out and say, I've got this issue. I need to talk for five minutes because those last five calls I was on really sucked and it just drained me mentally. Let's talk through this. And then when we started to realize that, we'd start grabbing agents and we'd say, hey, I'm going outside. Let's take a five minute walk. And all of a sudden you pull somebody off the phone and they go, well, I got to grab this next call. And, and you tell them, no, you're coming with me. You need to take a small break. And then they start to realize that, okay, it's okay if I need to ask for five minutes. And you start to change that mentality that, yeah, you're going to get beat up. Calls are going to suck. But at the same time, I want you to be taken care of. I want you to take care of and focus on yourself and your mental well-being as well. And when they start to realize that, the calls become not so difficult. They're not so much of a repetitive, I'm a punching bag. And that's that's just the way to start approaching it. And something else that I've noticed, and you've heard us talk about this before as well on the show, there exist private Facebook groups. And obviously I can't say any names because that would go against why the group is there. But you right. will just have these agents that talk about their worst interactions with customers. You don't, maybe in like a sea of 50 posts talking about how, man, this customer did this and it upset me in this way. And no matter what I said, they just couldn't get it through their head. You have maybe one good post that was like, yeah, somebody called in. And after the interaction, they said, you did a great job today. And it changed yep. everything. But when you have such this negative attitude that's being permeated by actual agents in these groups, yep, you're not doing yourself any favors, right? They build off one another. If those kinds of experiences, when you have those bad experiences, you need to get with management and talk to them about it because they're going to be the ones that are going to remind you, you're not here to be a punching bag. You right. are here to be a problem solver and it's going to be difficult, but in your heart of hearts, you want to solve the customer's issue. Yes. And I think it's it's a very counterintuitive thought to what most contact centers look at. I can't say contact centers, it's most brands look at with the contact right. center. I mentioned the, the churn and burn mentality. You know, agent turnover okay. is something that's constantly high. So you did mention uh, the things that you would do to kind of like lighten the mood and make your agents laugh after yeah. they would have a negative experience. What are some other steps, in your opinion, that contact centers can take to, to unlearn that churn and burn mentality? Yeah, I think it. you really have to start breaking it down. You have to talk to the staff. Your staff, your frontline agents are the most critical asset. People are irreplaceable. If you don't understand what the actual root cause of the problem is, you're just going to sit there and you're going to be training new people constantly, 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 right? But let's start Let's start step one. How many leaders do you know of that actually have called into their call centers and gone through the process? Went in even, a, even in an outsourced area, right? Maybe they're supporting hotels, they're supporting um, Airbnb, whatever it might be, right? They go out and actually experience it for themselves instead. They go stay at that location and then they go ahead and go through the motions and, and be that customer instead and see what it's like to get through to your support team and then how you're treated. Most companies that I know of never had that experience at a leadership level. One of the things that I used to do is occasionally I would call into the call center and I'd be sitting at home. Wouldn't matter. I had the call queue up on my iPad or on my computer. I was sitting there and I already knew kind of what was going on because I was watching chat, but I'd call in and eventually enough people started to know my voice that I had to start masking my number, masking my voice, right? And I'd talk to them and I'd say, yeah, I'm staying at such and such place. I'm having problems getting on the Wi-Fi. And occasionally I'd have the really good agent that would catch and I'd be like, uh-huh, hi, Jake. <laughs> and they just catch on really quick and they're like, okay. But it allowed me the experience to A, see how it was going through the call queue to make sure we actually, you know, taking care of getting the customer from the start point right into the call queue. But then also 
what was it like when I was talking to that agent? Could I tell they were frustrated from the start? Next, we looked at, okay, how do we take that information and really start to invest in the agents and give them an open area and avenue for feedback? One of the things that we really started to implement in the last year to two years is what's called the L10 process. And it's from a book called Traction. And what that is, is it allows the agents to sit there in a, in a biweekly meeting because we involved it all the way from leadership all the way down to the individual agent. And they were able to bring up and voice a concern. So with that concern, if it was something that could be solved at the initial leadership level, it'd be resolved. And they, and it wasn't just that the leader was saying, hey, this is what we're going to do to fix it. It was, what do you think here as a team we can do to fix this issue? And so it started to get team buy-in. But then if it was something that they couldn't resolve, what they would do is it would escalate up to the next layer and it would go up to the senior leadership level. And then what we would do is we would look at it as an issue and we'd start to process it. And we'd say, okay, why is this happening? What's occurring? What can we do to fix this? Not only just for this now issue, but also for the long term, So that we were actually addressing the bigger elephant in the room, right? Everybody loved to just fix all the small things. But if you're not taking care of how do I proactively fix this for the future, you're just setting yourself up for a constant cycle and repetitive cycle. And so we really do a lot of issue processing, talk about it. And then that information would trickle all the way back to the team. And we'd say, this is what we're going to do to fix this. But it may not work. And we set the expectation that things may not work every single time with what we're going to try. But what we want to do is we want to fail and we want to fail fast if we're going to fail and then we're going to course correct and we're going to change. We're going to try something new and we're just constant iterative and it becomes a continuous improvement piece, right? You're always iterating on top of something and making it better. And what we did on the, on the first probably quarter that we started this, the first three months, the agents were really quiet. We're a whole lot of issues coming up. We knew there were problems. But we kept beating, you know, we kept essentially going at it and the process never stopped. And the next thing you know, the guard started kind of dropping a little bit like, okay, this is, this is normal. We're starting to get into normalized process. I'm getting a little bit more comfortable with this. Maybe they're really, maybe they really do care. And so they bring up something and some things moved slow to get resolved, but other things moved quickly and they started to see that. And next thing you know, we started getting new ideas new issues. What about if we do this instead? And it wasn't even issues necessarily bring, they were bringing up. They were bringing up ideas on how to help address potential future problems. And that just started to unlock the team's potential because we started using our most powerful tool, our frontline agents, and unlocking their power and empowering them to be the change that as an organization we really needed to have instead of it being dri driven from the top down, so there's always going to be certain things driven from the top down, no matter what, it allowed them to drive from the bottom up and help us be a better team as an organization. Wow. That's, that's, that's incredible. You know, that I love that. It's almost like a trickle up effect, right? Correct. Instead of a trickle down we're, we're we are altering the laws of physics here. We are taking yep. feedback from the front line to help shape what we do as a whole, as opposed to us saying, hey, here's here's what we know works. You have to do it this way. You have to do it this way or you're out. Yep. I think, especially in a contact center environment, you have the opportunity for so much diversity. You have this opportunity for so much mutual learning, not just contact center agents learning how to do their jobs from their managers, but management that can understand Yes. The value, right? That's what it's all about, is the value that each individual brings on the team. And I love how you said you would call in and go through the customer journey on your own and experience what it was like, but you would also pay attention to how the agent was doing. I want to share a story. So yeah. my grandmother, she used to work for a retailer and she would always get fed up with <laughs> her management team because it always felt like they didn't understand what was going on and that, you know, everybody that was on the front line that was working soft lines or whatever was doing all the hard work. Yeah. Well, Thanksgiving rolled around 
And for the team members that had to work that day, management completely flipped it on its head. And for the first time, management got to serve the front line. It's such a small gesture, right? You don't think about oh, it. Is. Yeah, big deal, right? Management served their their frontline people food. Yep. But that's that's the whole thing of it. That's what you're talking about. That's what causes this trickle up effect is yep. having management recognize the value that those frontline workers bring and yep. being able to take the learning of that and apply it as a whole to make the the whole contact center better and hopefully people in c-suite people that are looking at this contact center as this necessary evil they start to see that and they're like wow maybe 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 we need to just stop appreciating our contact center as hey you did a good job here's a pizza party right, right. and more of wow there is a lot there are a lot of ideas there is there is so much opportunity here Absolutely. that we can learn from it's it's a mutual Absolutely. learning process and i think it's just a beautiful thing and and i challenge any leader to go sit the call center learn from those agents sit side by side with them take calls yourself that's one of the biggest differences if i had to jump on the phones i would usually we never hit the critical mass where i had to but I kept in close enough contact with the team that and the and the different process and procedures that if it ever hit a critical mass, I could jump in and help them. Because that's a difference in that that to the team meant a lot, knowing that if I had to, I would roll my sleeves up and jump on the phones. No matter how busy I was, I would have cleared my schedule. But at the same time, they also didn't want me in that realm. They wanted me to focus on keeping them taken care of as well. So it kind of worked both ways. You know, it was eventually we built that really good team rapport. But, you know, talking about like the, the trickle down effect, if you th we've all seen the, uh, the poster of the birds, right? Sitting on the, on the little tree and there's, there's a little, all the poop going down, right? That's what the trickle down effect for a management is commonly. That's why I like the other approach of them having a voice and bringing it up and helping make everybody better because not only are they making the team better, they're making their managers better as well. And they're having influence across the board. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic, man. What, what a fantastic note to end this show on. I mean, we, we continue to talk about this. Like we could talk about, well, what kind of poster do we make to reflect a trickle up effect? Cause I think if we tried to do what the trickle down effect did, it would yep. look weird and nobody would yeah. buy into it. Right. But yeah. Jacob, I got to say, man, well, that's weird. I feel like I'm talking in the third person now, <laughs> but uh, yeah, exactly. It has, it's been such a pleasure having you today. Uh, this has Absolutely. been such a wonderful discussion. I hope those of you who have tuned in today, uh, whether that's via our live discussion with CXQA Live or listening via the podcast, we hope that you took something very valuable from this conversation because we're a community and that's how we learn. We all learn together. So Jacob, again, man, thank you so much for your time. Guys, make sure that you're following Jacob with a C. That's <laughs> Jacob Shields, not Jacob with a K, Jacob Matthias, Jacob with a C on LinkedIn and Twitter and just stay up to date with what's going on in his life. Again, I've said it a million times, Jacob, thank you so much for adding, adding value just to the industry as a whole. Appreciate it. And thank you. Um, thank you for having me. And I, I look forward to it. Yeah, yeah. brother. All right, man. Well, Bye. well, I'm sure we'll see you again on the show at some point. <laughs> Absolutely. Look forward to it. All right. Thanks. Awesome. Well, thanks again, guys. Go be awesome and do something <laughs> incredible today. <laughs> Have a great see one. Ya. All right. Bye.